Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for August 11th. We are in Unit 3. We are in Unit 3 for the summer quarter. The unit title is Covenant, a Personal Perspective. Covenant, a Personal Perspective. Or Covenant from a Personal Perspective. Um, and our lesson... We're in lesson 11, lesson title from, this, from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly is Loyalty and Devotion. Loyalty and Devotion are devotional scriptures taken from Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Our background scripture, Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. And our printed passage or lesson text is Ruth chapter 1, taken from Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 to 11, and verses 14 to 18. The lesson aims from the adult quarterly, or number 1, identify Ruth and Naomi and tell why they were devoted to one another. Number 2, feel compassion for someone in a vulnerable situation. And then number three, demonstrate your loyalty and devotion to a spouse or other family member. The lesson has three major divisions after the introduction, which are number one, the first division I should say, headed to Judah. And that's covered between Ruth chapter one, verses six to 10. The second, Return home, that's covered by chapter 1, verse 11. And then the third is, where you go, I will go. And that's covered between verses 14 and 18. From the standard commentary, the lesson title is, A Mother-Daughter Covenant. A Mother-Daughter Covenant, and we've uh, shared in the past, the most common definition for covenant, and that is a, an agreement. It's a promise. It's a bond, and that uh, that's what it means in this context. Additional aims are number one: recall the dramatic account of Ruth's decision to go with Naomi from Moab to Israel. Number two: explain. How the historical context influenced the decision of Ruth, Naomi, and Ophra, and then or Orpa, let's just say, and then develop a plan to assist someone who is experiencing loss and or loneliness. This commentary has three major divisions as well. The first is first plea. Uh, verses six to ten. The second is second plea. Verses eleven and 14 and then the third is third plea and that's 15 to 18. Before we read our lesson text I um, uh, want to say a few words of introduction. Um, Ruth uh, of course covers a period or documents a period during the years of the judges. Uh, the judges the judges, or the period of the judges, lasted from 1370 to 1050 B.C., and it immediately followed the uh, uh, the entrance of the children of Israel into Canaan, and after the leadership of Joshua, after Joshua and his generation passed on, uh, and uh, it was a period when Israel was a loose confederacy, if you will, of tribes and the judges were called by God uh, to deliver them from a surrounding uh, nations that 
had subjected them or that were in, uh, afflicting them in one way or another because of their sin, because they had uh, strayed away from adherence to God's law and they had sinned and in many cases had gone whoring after other gods, the gods of the heathen around them. And the book of Ruth is, as, as if you're familiar with it at all, you know it's a love story. Uh, it is one that uh, contrasts uh, some very hard times and some very tragic times with uh, with the, the love and faithfulness and loyalty that uh, is is really uncommon. But God uses the faithfulness and the, the love and the self sacrifice of other people uh, to reach uh, the ones that He loves. And there's a lot more to uh, the backstory, if you will, and, and a lot between the lines when you read through Ruth that's not uh, that's not told that we have to to make some kind of assumptions about. Uh, for example, uh, Naomi obviously uh, withstood uh, a tremendous hardship in losing her husband. And losing her, ten, her two sons within 10 years of uh, leaving um, Israel, Bethlehem, and uh, her daughter-in-laws uh, were extremely impressed by her uh, in one way or another. And I happen to think uh, one of the ways they were impressed by her was how she handled that hardship and how she, she had an unshakable faith in God. And her relationship with God obviously was something that impressed uh, certainly Ruth, if not Orpah as well. So before we read our, our lesson text, the first uh, five verses uh, of the chapter basically have to do with uh, <clears throat> a famine, a severe famine being in the land, uh, Bethlehem, and Ruth was married to a man named Elimelech, and Elimelech uh, moved his family because of that famine, uh, some 70 or more miles, to Moab. Uh, and he had uh, two sons, Malon and Chilion, and they moved there. And we're not sure exactly when, but uh, sometime perhaps within the first few years, uh, Elimelech died. Uh, and his sons took these daughters, uh, Ruth and Opa. They were Moab, Moabite women. And uh, they uh, lived with their mother uh, for 10 years. And then each of them died, in, apparently in very short order, one after the other, uh, leaving Ruth uh, bereft of her husband and her two sons, and the two daughters, of course, bereft of their husbands. And, it, and it's really easy to think, well, <clears throat> maybe God was punishing Elimelech uh, for moving his family uh, instead of trusting God through this difficult time in Bethlehem, this this famine. Um, others stayed and perhaps they weren't as well prepared as they were. They didn't have food stores like others might have had. But uh, we, we can't we can't assume that. It's not it's really not uh, I know there's no basis for us to believe that this is some type of judgment on Elimelech or uh, his sons for that matter. So our lesson text picks up at verse 6 and it says then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people, giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughter-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. 
And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Return again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? And where are yet, sir, are there yet any more sons in my womb, that ye may be, that they may be your husbands? Then we skip over to verse 14, and it reads, And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfast minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And our key verse is verse 16. And again it reads, Whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So, again, verse 6 um, says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law. This is after she's heard that there is food, there's bread in Bethlehem. The Lord has visited them and brought rain and crops uh, and so there's food there uh, and so her first instinct is to she has really uh, no means of support uh, in Moab uh, women of course uh, in, in ancient times were very dependent on uh, their husbands or, or grown, grown sons or even brothers, um, they were uh, almost certainly going to be reduced to poverty and uh, if uh, they did not have the support of a male. So she thought to go back to her home and perhaps uh, be assisted by either her extended uh, family on her husband's side or her family. Uh, so then she arose with her daughters-in-law that they might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited her people with bread. Now, there, there, there was no love loss between um, the children of Israel and the Moabites. Uh, the Moabites actually were descendants of the... Um, of Lot by his first daughter. You remember that Lot, uh, in a drunken state, had incestuous, incestuous relationships with both his daughters, and the Moabites descended from them, and actually they were cursed into the tenth generation. They could not enter the assembly of God or become part of God's people. And so, and, and of course, they had had, they had uh, uh, not assisted uh, Israel when they were in the wilderness. Uh, they basically had uh, King Balak of Moab had hired Balaam to curse the Israelites. We can read about that in Deuteronomy 23. And, and so they, they were not on the best terms. Um, and, and, and so uh, we'll see in the next verse that uh, Naomi begins to realize, uh, she does a reality check as they begin to head toward Judah. So verse 7 says, Where, <clears throat> Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So it was instinctive for them to follow their mother-in-law. They had uh, formed a close bond. They had been together through tragedy, and they, quite honestly, uh, were family. I mean, they were uh, naturally going to try to support one another, uh, even even at this uh, very difficult time when there was no 
no means of support uh, in Moab. So, so I don't imagine they got too far down the road before uh, Naomi starts to think about what is lying, what's going to be lying ahead uh, for her daughter-in-laws. Uh, she, she doesn't know quite honestly what lies ahead for herself, but she begins to think whatever lies ahead for her, it's going to even be more difficult for her daughters-in-laws being Moabites. Uh, they're young women, or certainly younger, much younger than her, uh, and the prospects of them getting husbands in uh, in Judah are very slim because, of course, the, the, the Judean men were forbade from marrying uh, Moabites. Now, during this period of the, the judges, um, the, there wasn't, there doesn't appear to have been, and certainly at times, um, strict adherence to the law of Moses. Uh, they, um, in fact, in many cases, uh, they were disregarded. Uh, the fact that um, her sons, Naomi's sons, had married Moabite women uh, showed a, a little disregard for God's law in that connection. So verse 8 reads, And Naomi said unto her two daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So she realizes, yeah, hey, there's really nothing for them uh, in uh, Judah. Uh, they, they are well wishing uh, uh, and, and wanting to, to help me, no doubt, but uh, it's going to be very difficult for them there, and they would really fare better if they stayed here in the, in their own country and, and go back to their mother's house. Now, uh, the reason she perhaps mentions their mother's house is because uh, she, she probably would feel some guilt in taking them away from their own mother's uh, to, to ba basically help and support her as as daughters, uh, and then too, in that in that culture, the mother's house was uh, the house. Well, obviously, there was a father there as well, but uh, was it was regarded a place where the daughters were more likely to find new husbands, and and she she comments on how they have dealt with her kindly. Uh, and I, I, again, this is one of those places where we may have to read between the lines. You know, you read what you sow, and I, I, I can't, uh, can't, uh, can't help but think that uh, Naomi had showed them great kindness, and certainly they returned great kindness to her. Uh, and so, the she's she's really trying to be practical here, and. Uh, just, just realizing that um, again, it's going to be very difficult for her, more difficult yet for them, because it would be difficult for them to find husbands there, and she realizes a lot more difficult for them to find husbands in their own land. Now, one of the commentators says that the word covenant is not actually used in the book of uh, Ruth, but Naomi's desire for the Lord to deal kindly with her daughters-in-law includes a Hebrew term that is used frequently in the Old Testament and Old Testament situations involving covenants and oaths. And the term may signify willing devotion, kindness, and or mercy uh, that an advantaged party extends to someone disadvantaged. So they, she has felt as if she's been in a covenant relationship with them because of the kindness they've extended to her. And I, I, I'm sure vice versa, she's extended kindness to them. And perhaps she extended kindness to them first. And of course, they return that kindness to, to her. Verse 9, she says, The Lord grant you, and this is kind of a pronouncement of a blessing, the Lord grant you that ye may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice or voices and wept. 
The Hebrew word translated rest um, sometimes describes a place or state of peace, security, relief from anxiety. And that no doubt is what is suggested here. Naomi uh, really is probably concerned about the worries that they may have, the travails that that they may have. Uh, she knows what they've experienced already in the loss of their husbands, and she can look forward to seeing more of that, certainly if they, if they go with her. And so she is suggesting, and actually uh, asking the Lord uh, to provide them with this peace and the security that a husband, a new husband, can provide for them. Uh, in, in, in a house uh, 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 that's safe again and, 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 and secure. And uh, at that, they, they, they just break down, uh, their emotions break down, and they lift up their voices, and they weep again. But Naomi is making some sense to at least one of them without giving uh, them, well, she does, actually give them uh, further explanation as to as to why it's not practical for them to to go with her to return with her to to Judah the so verse 10 says and they said unto her surely we will return with thee unto thy people and and I think at first they both were genuinely thinking that you know, hey, she needs us, and we need to stay together as a family. Uh, and uh, and of course, a, one of the commentators suggested it was customary for uh, daughters-in-laws in such situations uh, to to basically uh, f force the the person that they were trying to help or offer some assistance to to push them away. Uh, uh, they didn't want to make it appear that uh, that they were abandoning them, uh, and I'm not sure about that at all. Somebody else is reading between the lines, but I think they they really thought that they needed to stick together. They were accustomed to to being a family. I don't know how much of the ten years they had been with Naomi, but certainly a strong bond had developed and they thought uh, they could assist her because they knew, uh, again, unless she had a family that was going to offer uh, a great deal of support, she was going to need it from someplace. So um, she said, uh, so, so they, they offer, uh, they, ins they, they, they offer, they insist on returning with her to her people. Again, not thinking thinking it through uh, as practically as they, they perhaps should, and, and at least one of them will here in just a minute. And I'm not suggesting that Ruth doesn't think it through as well, but Ruth uh, has reasons for com committing, and as we'll see later, cleaving to Naomi, uh, and we'll get into those uh, later, at least some thoughts about those. So verse 11 is the second plea. Uh, reads, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Now, what she is suggesting here is uh, that something that uh, certainly she was familiar with, but perhaps uh, they were not. Uh, the, and that is a custom known as the Leverite marriage. The Leverite right marriage, which uh, is uh, is really spoken of in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6. And it's part of the Jewish custom. Maybe the Moabites had a similar custom. Not sure, but certainly part of the Jewish custom and part of the law. Uh, if a, uh, a a man uh, died without a son, without an heir, uh, his brother was to take his wife, and the first child that they had was to uh, be given 
the, the, the deceased brother's name and inheritance. He was to continue his name. Uh, and, of course, now in this case, two brothers have died. Uh, neither had children. Uh, and that leaves no brothers. That leaves no brothers of any age. And so <laughs> what, uh, what Naomi is, is saying is, hey, uh, you know, we don't know whether she was past menopause or not. Uh, maybe she wasn't, but nearing it. But she said, are there any more sons in my womb uh, that they might be your husbands? And, uh, and then she's going to be get even more practical than that. If you read the verses between, if you read 12, 13, uh, 12 and 13, she basically uh, furthers the point in saying, and, 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 and if I were to marry myself again tonight, today, and I were to, uh, were to conceive tonight, uh, and, 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 and maybe twins, and I'm, I'm adding that, of course, uh, uh, would you wait until they were grown to marry? No, no, you wouldn't. I mean, she's really being practical. She's talking about them waiting another 20 years, and perhaps by that time they would be uh, in menopause and unable to bear children. So she's being extremely practical here. And, uh, and, and so we're going to pick up at verse 14 after she has driven home the point of um, them not, it not being practical for them to wait for them. And of course, uh, that, there are certainly limits to the Leverite marriage. Uh, it didn't apply in every case. I mean, in, in cases where uh, you had a brother of marriageable age or one that even could be waited on a few years, uh, it, it was appropriate. But in other cases like this, uh, it didn't apply. So the best thing pr from a practical solution, and a human uh, logic solution, was for them to go back to their people. They could probably find husbands a lot more easily in Moab and uh, and uh, have the peace and the stability that Naomi wants for them. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave to her. So Oprah has, Orpah, I should say, has gotten it. Orpah has, her uh, logic has really uh, registered with, uh, Naomi's logic is really registered with Orpah, and she's gotten it. So uh, she kisses mother-in-law, and she says, uh, God bless you. Uh, I am going back to my people, going back to my my mother's house, and hopefully find another husband. Now earlier, um, Naomi had said something about going back to your people and going back to your gods, and she wasn't suggesting that they necessarily go back to practicing um, being heathens, but uh, she knew that uh, uh, there was going to be a significant cultural change for them in Judah. Uh, that was something else, and they would be more comfortable in their own culture. Uh, and uh, so, again, Orpah got it, and she returns uh, to her mother. But when it says, Ruth, but Ruth clave to her, this word... Clave is the same word that is used uh, in Proverbs 18.24, which reads, There is a, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. It's the same word that's used in, in Genesis 2.24, when uh, the Lord says, uh, Male and female made he, and the man shall leave his father's house and cleave to his wife. Uh, and, and, and so it talks about a, an, uh, a, a sticking uh, as close as possible to her. That's what she is doing. She's sticking as close as possible to Naomi. So verse 15, this is the third plea. Okay, Orpah's gone. Verse 15, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people. And unto her gods, 
Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So she's saying, hey, Orpah got it. You know, um, you need to do the same. She's made the, the practical choice, um, and you need to do the same. I, and she's, she's already made the case. Not going to be any more husbands coming out of me. So, um, and, and I don't know what's lying ahead for me. Only God knows that. And I'm reading between the lines here. Uh, so um, you need to do what's best for you. Now, I said something uh, at the outset about uh, kind of having to read between the lines and fill in some blanks here. Uh, the next few verses are going to be uh, <clears throat> a very, some very passionate statements made that were really caused by um, uh, an impression that it made on Ruth by this woman, Naomi, that actually caused this deep love and loyalty. They were not told anything about the relationship between Naomi and Ruth. Uh, there's nothing said about what Naomi did or said to her daughters-in-law, but but you have to know that Naomi made a tremendous impression on her. Uh, she showed her love. She showed her God. You know, she showed her uh, uh, loyalty herself. And so Ruth is is uh, loyal to a fault uh, because of this significant impression that Naomi has no doubt made on her. And again. Uh, reading between the lines, but it's the only thing that I think is practical to assume. So verse 16 says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So what is she saying here? She's saying, and from the NIV, it maybe reads a little clear. It says, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. She's saying, don't try to convince me. Don't. It doesn't matter how logical uh, it may uh, seem that I should go back to my people. Uh, I'm sticking to you uh, uh, as closely as I can. He said, wherever you go, uh, I'm going with you. Wherever you stay, I'm staying with you. And she's saying, uh, your people are going to be my people. In other words, uh, she's, she's basically abandoning her people. She's leaving her people, and she's going to adopt uh, Naomi's people, the Jewish people. Uh, the Judean people, and she's also going to accept Naomi's God. Now, why would she be so willing to do this? You, 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 again, I said you have to conclude that Naomi has made a tremendous impression on her uh, with her, her love, her character, but she's also shown her God. Why would she be willing to abandon uh, her gods uh, and embrace uh uh, Naomi's God, because Naomi has no doubt showed her a faithfulness to this God, despite her, uh, the great trials that she's been through. And I happen to think that the fact that, uh, the way rather, that Naomi dealt with the loss of her husband and dealt with the loss of her sons in faith and not abandoning her God, you know, not accusing her God or cursing her God, but in faith really inspired like faith in Ruth. Uh, and, and certainly we want to have the kind of impression on those around us uh, that cause a fierce loyalty and devotion to us. But better still, we want to be loyal and devoted to others. Uh, and I think once they see our loyalty and our devotion and our love, uh, they will return uh, the same. You know, you reap what you sow, the universal principle uh, of, of the harvest, the universal law of the harvest is what we're talking about here. So um, she, she's made this this this, this pro profound statement here of commitment. 
and, and, and keep in mind, she has no obligation whatsoever to care for Naomi. Naomi is not her mother. And Naomi, of course, is, uh, is Jewish and she's Moabite. She can go back and take care of her own mother in her, no doubt, old age. Um, so she has, she's not obligated to do this. This is a, a devotion that's born out of love. Verse 17. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and also, if I, and more rather, also, if aught but death part thee and me. Let's read that from the NIV as well. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it. It be it ever so severely, if any, or if even death rather separates you and me. So this is a, now this is a curse she's pronouncing on herself. If anything comes between them, and and, and again she's not even allowing that death will come between them because she wants to be buried where Naomi is buried. Now this is this is some kind of of fierce loyalty some type some kind of love would to god husbands and wives would would speak this to each other in their vows you know like maybe i've heard this spoken once or twice in wedding vows but this is the kind of commitment that god wants us to have one to another certainly husbands and wives and and, and not just husbands and wives but he wants us to be devoted loyal to those we love and to those who are in need and we have the means to to provide for their needs or to provide to assist them in their needs. So she's saying, nothing is going to separate me from you. And if something does, may God do the worst to me and more than I can imagine or more than I can speak. That's a serious, that's a serious curse to pronounce on yourself. So after her making this Again, this uh, profound statement of commitment and then pronouncing a curse on herself. If anything, parts comes between them or separates her from them, even in death. Naomi is just, you know, she throws her hands up and verse 18 says, When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her steadfastly minded you know we need to be steadfastly minded about things we we need to be steadfast unmovable always of abounding in the work of the lord for as much as we know our labor is not in vain we need to be steadfast about doing the will of god and and about being uh about sh showing god's love in intangible ways uh, through loyal commitments to assist, uh, and as such as uh, such as Ruth is doing here, and this is an incredible love story. First of all, between mother and daughter-in-law, it shows a covenant bond, uh, not 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 a formal covenant, but an informal uh, covenant uh, relationship uh, that they share one with another. And, of course, it blossoms beyond this, if you read the, all of Ruth, which I hope you have, into a love story between Ruth and uh, the man that becomes her husband, Boaz. And Boaz, of course, was the son of, uh, a descendant of Rahab, uh, the prostitute. And uh, she was, obviously, she was from Jericho. She was not an Israelite. Uh, and, of course, in the lineage of David, who was and, uh, the, uh, and then Christ, of course, from, a, from a, a human side, being in the lineage and heir of, uh, and an heir of David. Uh, and uh, here this Moabite, Ruth, marries uh, Boaz, and they, of course, produce Obed. And Obed produces Jesse, and Jesse, of course, produces David, the king. And then, of course, God, in Second Samuel chapter 7, God gives 
David that promise that his his seed, his descendant, uh, would reign on the throne forever. His descendant, singular, who reign on the throne forever. And of course, we know that descendant being none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So this this is a beautiful story. Uh, again, our focus today has been on the bond, the covenant between mother and daughter-in-law. And would to God, every mother and daughter-in-law relationship was as beautiful as this one. You know, we characterize, uh, uh, we make caricatures, and we we joke about mother-in-laws and and the relationship they have with their daughters-in-laws. Uh, and that's I don't know if that's not perhaps a modern uh, uh, tendency or trend, but this really shows what mother and daughter-in-law, a mother and daughter-in-law bond can be like and certainly a mother and daughter bond can be like so hopefully uh, we've learned a little more today than we knew and we pray that God would bless and keep you in his name in Jesus name Amen